So we're going to talk about fashion. Uh, so let me just say quickly, fashion is also a verb. <laughs> we fashion things. So the idea that we would search for beauty in fashion, I think, is quite wonderful. And we were just talking that Murray Gell-Mann, the physicist who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the quark, we have more than one thing happening at a time, at the same time. Um, opened his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize by saying this. We have discovered something phenomenal in theoretical physics, that the more and more beautiful a mathematical formula begins to appear, mm -hmm. the more and more likely it is true. <laughs> so we're here to talk about truth and beauty. And the thing about fashion and the making of things, I think, has to be brought to the surface with the search for beauty and the sort of magical power of it. And I've been working a lot in fast fashion down to the chemicals. And it's, I like to think of the most astonishingly beautiful fast fashion being the cherry blossom. Think about this cherry tree. It decides in the spring to be pink. And it explodes with 10,000 blossoms, just in case one of them will attract a pollinator. Think about that. Truth and beauty. And this is not sustainability. Because I, was at, I won the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development at the White House. My mother was there. She said, what, what have you been doing? <laughs> I said, well, and the press came up and said, what's sustainability? Mr. Sustainable. I said, I'm not interested in sustainability. If I asked you what's your relationship to your spouse and you said, sustainable. <laughs> 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 so I, that's why we're here to talk about fashion. And we can use it to attract things and so on. So, so the cherry blossom goes back to the ground in a few days. It is ephemera. And it nourishes the soil. Now imagine if our fashion did that. Imagine if our fast fashion was like that kind of celebration. And we're not worried about it. We just enjoy it. And we let it go back to the soil. And we do it again. Right? Now think about that. Now that would be on the biological side. Things going back to the soil. Now on the technical side, and we'll hear from people who are working in materials of all kinds. In the technical side, we want materials to go back to industry and don't contaminate the natural world. See? So that those are products as a service. We can design them for reuse. And please don't use the term end of life designing for end of life, it really scares the children. Okay? <laughs> you go home and say, what were you doing today? I was designing for the end of life. I mean, <laughs> so end of use. <laughs> and because if you design for the end of use, then the next question is, what's the next use? Mm -hmm. So now you're designing for next use. Now you're in the circular economy. Design for next use. See? So sometimes the use will be soil. Sometimes the use will be technology. But in all cases, it needs to be safe and healthy. Mm -hmm. Because a circular economy of bads, think of it, we talk about having goods and services. What if we had bads and services? And then we have a circular economy of bads. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's do it again. Mm -hmm. So recycling clothing that's toxic or suboptimal is worse. We just did it again. <laughs> So the people here are doing things in this space that are magical. So you're going to get to hear from them. That'll be the fun part. But I think it's really important to think about it because we're now at the point where people around the world are worrying about things, and especially our children, and especially us once we know a lot, and we know a lot. And for example, microfibers are now attached to the issue of fabrics. So how do you make clothing when your kid goes, are we making microfibers? Mm -hmm. Have you heard about nanoparticles from polyester yet? They can break the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. Whoa. So like, what are we putting on our bodies? What are we wearing? What are we making? And the question becomes, how beautiful is it? How can something be beautiful <clears throat> if it destroys children's health? or the environment. So let's go make beautiful things. And that's what everybody here is, is doing. 
So I'd like to just have the, the panelists introduce themselves and give you their name and also give the, one of the burning questions they have so that we can get started. And I think if there's time, uh, we'll have questions. So just save those for the moment. And then let's try and weave a tapestry here together of biological nutrients and technical nutrients and something gorgeous that you can give to the next generation. How beautiful can it be? <laughs> let's try for that. OK? Brooke. Thank you. It's never easy to be, speak after you. <laughs> I'm feeling I'm breaking the silence, the religious silence in the room. Um, so my name is Brune Poisson, Brune Poisson. I'm a junior minister for the environment in France. And um, I spend a lot of my time uh, trying to fix or play a small role in fixing um, the textile industry, I would say. And perhaps one of my questions would be, how do we make it affordable? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that sustainable is not something for the rich and that if you're poor, you have no other choice but to actually consume something which is bad for the planet. And so if you're poor, on top of that, you're not doing, uh, you know, it's difficult for you to, uh, to have a positive impact on the planet. So I guess that's my question. You know, what are the, how, how can we work around that? Um, and then I can tell you a bit about what we do in France. My name is Holly Syrett, and I am one of the uh, Global Shapers community representatives here at Davos. Um, I'm from the Amsterdam hub, and I'm really keen to talk today about how citizens can be involved in the fashion revolution. I believe there's a real power in purchase, and uh, that we want to be a, play a part in that. So I look forward to talking about it. Um, within the Global Shapers community, I've founded a project that has spread to 45 cities called Shaping Fashion, and um, I also work at the Sustainable Apparel Coalition on meaningful transparency in the value chain, but also at product level. Good, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anderson Tenoro. I'm based in Singapore. Uh, we are a uh, viscose uh, cellulose-based uh, textile manufacturer. We're the largest uh, viscose rayon producer in the world. Uh, but beyond that, we see ourselves as, as part of the solution to the, to the raw material crisis that's happening in the textile industry. Um, maybe I'll ask the audience, do you guys know what's inside your textile as, as you're wearing it now? Um, have any of you guys read the labels? Um, and that, that's, I think, the question that maybe I would like everyone to get an answer to uh, eventually later this evening when you take off uh, and get some rest. So I think it's important for everyone to know what they're wearing so that all the consumers can make a choice. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miroslava Duma. I'm um, one of representatives of uh, Young Global Leaders of World Economic Forum, um, and it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and uh, uh, I'm a founder and CEO of an uh, investment company called Future Tech Lab, as well as a co-founder of a material science brand called Pangaea, Gaia from Mother Earth in Greek mythology. And so, um, yes, I'm very- Big fan of her brand. So. Thank you very much. We just literally mm. started uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so we're bringing those amazing material science uh, breakthroughs to the world through products of everyday use. Uh, very much, I guess, what Tesla does in, in the space of um, um, automotive. Um, so um, um, can I talk? I'm so excited, talk. I can't <laughs> wait uh, <laughs> about some of those uh, companies. I, I think my introduction will be way longer than, than all of yours, so I, I do apologize in advance. So. Um, uh, if you think about, uh, you know, textile, apparel, fashion, materials uh, industry, which is almost $3 trillion gigantic industry, and one of the most polluting industries in the world, which is absolutely crazy to, to you know, to, to think about, um, it is still using uh, materials and patents that were invented hundreds, if not thousands, years ago. So linen was invented 36 years thousand years ago. Denim was invented 150 uh, years ago. Um, cotton was invented in 1794. And pretty much everything in our lives and our world is made of materials, right? From pretty much the whole room, from carpets to furniture to what we wear, which is our second skin, to, you know, space, uh, space uh, 
uh, rockets that goes to uh, space to money that are made of uh, linen and cotton. So literally, absolutely everything is made of materials in our um, in our lives. And um, at the same time, by uh, 2030, the uh, population is estimated to grow by 20 percent. The demand for food is estimated to grow by 40 percent, and demand for textiles is estimated to grow by 80 percent. Because again, literally everything is made of materials and and, and textiles. And so, um, I'm, as much as it's a very scary time that we're, you know, living and going through now, and I'm a mother of three, you know, sometimes I wake up at night, you know, scared and, and, and thinking, what should we, what should we do now? Um, as uh, it's also, for me personally, even more excited to, to leave uh, today and be able to do something today, uh, because we're very much lucky to be working with one of the greatest scientists um, of, of, of our times that are reinventing the world through material science. So just to give you a couple of examples of the companies that we are working with, investing in, so anything from growing leather um, and fur from stem cells to uh, spider silk technologies. So they take a DNA of a stem cell of spider and grow silk, which is softer than a cloud, but can go, go up to 400 times stronger and tougher than steel. Can you imagine? So in future, you know, this pavilion or a Congress center potentially can be built from spider silk. Um, you can convert CO2 into uh, chemicals and plastics and fuel. You can convert methane gas another huge major problem into PHA biopolymers. You can uh, convert pretty much the whole uh, agricultural food waste that we generate every year uh, into yarns and textiles and products. So imagine where a jacket going forward, in, well, actually even today, uh, made of recycled uh, banana peels or citrus waste. So it's a really, really, really exciting uh, moment. And uh, we're trying to get those innovations out of labs and bring them to the world. I have so much more to share, but I'm going to stop here and uh, <laughs> hope we'll add later. Fair enough. <clears throat> I think this idea of working with materials, you were describing things that can basically go back to nature, everything you described. So I think for everyone's purpose of purposes here, I would like to point out, when you hear the word biodegradable today, you have to be a little bit concerned because biodegradable could be oxodegradable, it could be various kinds of things where it's breaking down between the polymer elements and crystals and not all the way. And it becomes little inert objects, some of which are quite small and sharp um, and aren't fun uh, in the biosphere. They may be inert, but what we're looking for is things that break down into carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen mm -hmm. so they can go back to soil safely and to the biosphere that way. So when you hear biodegradable, it might not mean totally biodegradable. It might mean just the amorphous material between polymer crystals. So just think carbon. <laughs> so that's what you just heard. So Anderson, um, you're in the business of that, right? And you're a friend of trees eh? yeah. in your business, right? So when you think of all the sources of fiber, uh, one of the great things about viscose, for example, is this is a material from trees. Thank you, Bill. Maybe I'll just take a step back a little bit um, to introduce the textile world in numbers. Uh, we consume about 107 million tons of textiles, 107 million tons of textile a year, of which 70% is polyester based, um, which is a huge surprise to everyone when I throw the numbers out, but it is, it is the truth. Another 20 25% is cotton based, and about 5 to 6% is actually uh, cellulose based or other, other materials. And we play in the cellulose space where we believe. Uh, there is a great opportunity for us to continue to grow this business. Uh, we start from plantation-based eucalyptus or acacia trees, uh, and we dissolve them to cellulose, and we spin them to actually become viscose railing. But because the fact that the process in itself, Bill, I think you know this very well, is quite chemical intensive. So by no means that viscose is the solution of the future. And we believe that we're tripling down a lot on other technologies, such as the lyocell technology or some of the companies that we actually jointly invest in on ion cell, we really want to move the cellulose carbon molecules straight to spun fiber uh, that is not only biodegradable, but actually ability to um, go back to the ground. But people forget that now textiles are always lended for performance. So if you can read some of the labels in which you, I'm sure you'll do this evening, we will see 60% polyester, 30% cotton, 
maybe 8% rayon and 2% spandex, so that's stretchable. Um, and that's the challenge, in that if we want to have value chains that eventually go back down to the soil or can be reused and recycled, it needs to be designed right from the beginning. Um, I think that's the big challenge for us. Perhaps from our perspective, we, we would like to work collaboratively with brands, uh, with, uh, with uh, a lot of these uh, larger companies who are front-facing with the customers, but it has to be designed right from the beginning. Great. We, we've created something in Amsterdam called Fashion for Good. Yes. And one of the first uh, product projects that we did there, and the Credit Cradle Protocol that we've developed, and that works through the uh, Fashion for Good too, is to design the first 100% uh, organic cotton garments that are so clean you could eat them. Uh, they're assessed to the molecule for ecological and human health. Um, they're done in a factory where the only water leaving a textile mill is by evaporation. It's distilled water. Why would you want to take water out in from a pipe when you have a fully defined effluent with safe chemistry if you use it again? Okay. And it's 100% renewably powered either wind or sun. Um, the people are treated fairly and with dignity and it's seven euros for t-shirt retail. And now we have jeans, the same quality, 28 euros. Mm -hmm. Mass market pricing, ways that are done, starting from the beginning, let's go for it. And so that, I think this kind of instinct that you hear here, it's like, how do we take this and do constant improvement and make it available to people? Yeah. So before we get to the consumers, I'd like to look at the policy issues. Because you've done something in the last 48 hours, 60 hours, yes, something like that, 60, 60 hours, um, that is revolutionary. And you know, we're used to, I come from Charlottesville, Virginia, where I lived in a house designed by Jefferson. So we, we used to say, you know, we can do revolutions here. <laughs> uh, so the French are good at this too. <laughs> well, you must, right? you know, we know how to behead, uh, behead kings. Uh, <laughs> and, but that's, yeah, but what, what I think we, we're seeing here is the idea of policy and the role policy can play and regulation. And when you start out on these journeys, you start with uh, an insight. Oh, you know, let's make an electric car, whatever. Uh, or let's do fabrics like this. Then you look at an overview of the whole industry. And you start saying, oh, what's going on here? And then you get to a standard where you can start to behave a certain way. And you don't do it with regulation. You do it because it's what is the right thing to do. And it's like Peter Drucker said, it's a manager's job to do something the right way, but it's the executive's job to do the right thing. Then give it to the managers to do the right way. Because if you're doing the wrong thing and your manager with Six Sigma perfection, you become perfectly wrong. Okay? wrong. So what is it to be perfectly right? So as we look at policy, Policy follows standards. So if somebody can create these things, then they exist, which means they're possible. Remember, Leibniz basically said if it's possible, it exists, but that's for creative people. For most people, they need to know it exists, and then it's possible. So the things now exist, and they were done without laws. They were done because people were trying to do the right thing. And these crazy things you might even hear about, these are people trying to do the right thing in our time. So from there, a standards, then you can go to policy because the policymakers can say it exists, therefore it's possible. And then, if you're really good at it, you can get to regulation because you've gone through policy to regulations and you've checked, your, checked your, you know, all your stops. You just did something phenomenal. Why don't you tell everyone what it is? <laughs> Thank you, now you're raising the bar, I think. Um, so what did we do? Uh, two things. One of the problems with um, the fashion industry that it's really truly global. Uh, you know that as well as I do. So it, it was, and so in a context, so you have two choices. If you want to regulate, either you come up with an international treaty and you know it's gonna take 20 years and it will end up in something not that ambitious. Or you can try and work around and, and, and make, make sure that things start to exist so that later you can actually regulate it. So this is what we did with the Fashion Pact. And I say we, but I should rather say, you know, um, 
uh, Eva Cruz, Paul Polman, uh, obviously um, François-Henri Pinault of Caring, who really led the initiative and did an amazing job bringing together more than 35 uh, companies representing about 150 brands. And they came together um, and, and committed to doing tremendous things, obviously, but most importantly, in a holistic way. So they brought together, and we asked them rather, to, to, to work on three key issues, which is carbon, nature, because we won't reach carbon neutrality if we don't ad address the issue of biodiversity and the ocean. And so they, are make, they, they, they made commitments, and now it was, it, it was absolutely great because it shows that actually you have a bunch of companies and it exists that commit to doing more. And it's also, it's, it's also that initiative, the Fashion Pact, was also very important because it shows that even though governments are not willing to do a lot in the field of climate, you can still walk a, work around that and that actually collaborating at the international level works and can deliver uh, concrete, concrete things. So that's on the one hand. But anyway, so that was the Fashion Pact. And then we had to walk the talk. It existed, so we had to turn it into regulation in France. And so we decided in the regulation to focus on you know, the basics, or what, what are the basics in, in the textile uh, industry, and I'm going to tell you that, uh, what I call the quick wins, and then we established long-term goals, and now where we we'll need your help is how do we go from the quick wins to achieving the long-term goals. So what are the quick wins that we put in, in the law, in the regulation, which as you rightly pointed out, we just passed like literally two days ago. So I don't know if you're aware of it, but in the fashion industry, a lot of clothes just get discarded. They could be used, but they're, they're, they're just discarded. They get destroyed. It's actually a $500 billion market, the exactly. discarded clothing. Right, yeah. In France, total unsold goods equal to $1 billion a year, almost. And it's like, it's, so, so it's huge. And it's, it's actually, it's unbearable when you think that people can basically, in France, some people don't dare actually going on the streets or looking for a job because they don't like the way, it's not that they don't like, it's because they cannot afford clothing. So that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you have all these companies just throwing out. So now we've banned it. It's no longer possible to do that. So that's the first um, key sort of basics. The other thing also, is that I don't know if you're aware of it, but one third of the plastics in the ocean comes from just yeah. our clothes. Because when we wash them, a lot of microparticle, plastic microparticles just gets, gets released. So in France, within the, um, within the next three years, it will no longer be possible to sell, if you are a washing machine manufacturer, to sell a washing machine without a filter that actually prevents all those microplastics from just like um, flowing into our rivers and in our, our ocean. So it's going to be for domestic washing machines, but also industrial washing machine. Another thing also is that we have changed the EPR system, you know, the polluter pay system on, in the textile uh, sector. And one of the things that we, we're doing, we are setting targets to, the fashion, to fashion companies so that they think um, twice, they eco-conceive the products. Uh, so they have to think about how, how, how can they recycle them or how can they become biodegradable in the future potentially. So it means, for example, not mixing different fabrics, just like uh, what you said. So I'm not, there are 130 measures in the law. I'm not gonna go through uh, <laughs> all of that. And, and we also, so that's on the one hand, and perhaps one last thing. Also, we are going to go for transparency on the env environmental impact of the clothing. So we, when you buy something, you're going to know what is the impact on nature, on carbon, on water, of the piece of, of, piece of clothes that you're wearing. Anyway, that's just to give you a few examples. Now, what we need to do, we need to take that to the EU level. And most importantly, I need you to now tell me what is the next step and what can we do. And please, I want to make France really a lab, a laboratory for innovation in the textile fashion industry. Uh, the government can help. Uh, we, we, need, we need your help. We need your ideas. We need your creativity. We need to, do, to come up with something beautiful, yeah. as you just said. So please come to France to help us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> We have a joke in our office 
that before you can do ecosystem design, you have to do your ecosystem management. <laughs> That's so, nice. Yeah. And so I think, you know, the people and why they do things is always a mystery to me. <laughs> you know, when you think about this, some of these things appear obvious once you are exposed to them. And so I think that's the kind of thing that, that um, I think will come to pass once we see these regulations go into effect and we see what we're able to do. We'll say, well, that was obvious, really. Mm. And I, you know, I hope it comes soon. And I'm sure it will be beautiful. So as far as people go, Holly, maybe you could help us with this one. Good. I was already uh, getting jumping up and down. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> I know you're there. And I do uh, want to say, this is no small feat, yeah. what has been achieved in France. Especially what I'm very excited about is the uh, legislation that impacts how you can communicate about clothing. Um, to talk to Bill, what you said before, that people want to do the right thing. I'm extremely optimistic that people do want to do the right thing. Also, when it comes to clothing, they want to make better choices, but don't currently have the information available to them that they need to do so. We don't have that. I don't believe people want to buy clothing that has been made by people who are exploited, who are uh, not trade, uh, or work in unsafe conditions, who aren't paid fairly. I don't believe people want to buy clothing that absolutely devastates our environment or where or, or is made from oil. I've been walking around here at Davos, which is a huge privilege, and I've been talking to people about their clothing. The majority of people also here, the brightest people in the world, or the influent, most influential people in the world don't know their clothing is made from oil. So we have a huge opportunity to educate and to provide that information. And I think legislation is one way to make sure that brands, retailers and manufacturers can collaborate to getting that information to people. Um, and I say people and I say citizens because I also think when we're talking about affecting change and really accelerating towards a sustainable apparel industry and we do need to accelerate because as Mira as you were saying if the industry keeps on growing as it does by 2050 it will have tripled we can't afford it to triple in any way so we need to talk to and start engaging with people and with citizens um, not just consumers I think when you're talking about sustainability you need to be aware about the science the facts the grounded environmental methodologies on which sustainability claims are made but also about storytelling do you see yourself as just a consumer? Take, waste, dispose? I don't believe, Bill, that's in line with your theories or application of how we see the world. I don't think that's modern. I don't think we will just be consumers. I think we will loan clothing. Maybe we will wear it and it will dissolve into, hopefully not when we're wearing it, but dissolve into biodiversity. I think there are many other ways um, to look at that. So citizens and getting the information that we need so that we can choose the brands and the retailers that we can trust on basis of our values. And my values might differ to yours. Um, uh, maybe uh, vegans will have different um, information that they're looking for. Um, I, I think that in information needs to be statistical, scientific, comparable. Um, and so besides having that information, we need to have the power to actually do something with it as individuals. So I think the legislation is a great thing. Um, I fully agree that it can't just be in one nation. Otherwise, corporations will be just complying to, oh, this is what's happening in France. This is what's happening in Germany. That doesn't work. It has to be at, a, at least a European or at even an international level. I'd be very keen to see how the Global Shapers community can support you in, a, in reaching that. Um, as I said, within the WEF, we've been able to reach out to 45 cities, and that's just within two years. So I'm very excited to see how many more people we can activate. Um, and I think at the end of the session, if we have time, I'd like to talk about how today we can already make choices to start de developing the future of fashion, because it starts with ourselves. We have a lot of power. Power is in the purchase, and um, yeah, we can do it. Bravo. One of the, yeah. One of the things that I find critical in all this is our language, how we speak, what we say. So if we see things as biological nutrients and we see things as technical nutrients that don't contaminate each other, and we talk about the plastic clothing, we are developing ways now 
to separate the polyester and the cotton mm -hmm. with chemistries. We can get back to cellulose. We can get back to polyester. And then we have to look at the polyester and say, you know, maybe not spun yarns, you know, maybe filament yarns, so they can't break into microfibers. You know, let's get on this. And then we have to make sure we give it the hand that people are going to want, things like that. So, and then we have to think of those as products of service. The technical nutrients are products of service. What we want is the service, not necessarily the ownership. And that's why, as Bruno mentioned, you know, there are different models for these things. And what you'll find is you can be authentically connected to these issues while we share clothing with people, of course, you know, and we're seeing lots of this going on in the sustainability world, you know, where people are, are renting clothes or, or passing them on. We make heirlooms. These are durable goods, and, and we get to celebrate them over time, that kind of thing. But I'd just like to cast the language, and then maybe we can ask, have questions. That's okay. Um, I think the word consumer is going to kill us. <laughs> Because you cannot consume a TV set. Right? It's 4,360 chemicals, many of which are highly toxic. And if you call yourself a consumer of television, you know, I worry for you. So <laughs> the idea we would call it consumers is ridiculous because you cannot consume plastics. Now, we can consume these biological materials, and they can go back to soil safely. So we can be a consumer of biological nutrients. In fact, if you're not, you're dead because you haven't had lunch. So if you think about it, consumers, we can call people who take things, objects of consumption, the cherry blossoms. But the products of service, you know, if you have 10,000 cherry blossoms made out of polyethylene, you know, you got to go pick it up. It's not going back to nature. So you can't consume that stuff. So we call those customers. And so you're, they're service to you. You see, that's where you get the products of use. And that's going to be a little change in the headset because in retail, the customer is the retail store and the consumer is the buyer of what in the retail store. So, but I think the word consumer is, is too, too scary because most of the stuff we need really should be put in cycles and used over and over and over again, whether we reform it or we, we share it, things like that. So it might be just a hint of how we pursue this. And then you can make beautiful things because you're coherent, right? And it's true. There's the transparency. Okay, so we have time for questions. Sure. Other questions? Please address it directly to the person you'd like to speak to. I don't really need it. Thank you. I was wondering if Mira could talk about uh, the new jacket that um, mm -hmm. she's sort of been pioneering, which is, uh, I think, flower and alternative to down. Thank you very much. Topic of cherry blossom, I think yes. that's mm -hmm. perfect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Speaking about change, you know, that the only constant in the universe <laughs> is change, right? And I was actually looking now at, um, at the forefront of 2020, I was looking at what happened and what, how our lives have changed since um, 2010 to 2020, right? So the first iPad was launched in 2020, Instagram was launched in 2020 and really completely changed, I guess, the media industry. Uber was changed, it was launched in 2020. So, you know, the way we travel, the way we, you know, read, the way we leave, the way we pretty much, you know, do everything has changed. Um, I guess one of the very few things, I mean, temperatures are changing, right? Unfortunately. Um, and I guess one of the very few things that are not changing are the materials, again, and textiles that we're using. And uh, speaking about flower down, um, so we have partnered with these amazing scientists who come from um, Florence. Um, so they've been working for the past 20 years with the European Space Agency, creating um, spaces for astronauts to go to space. Um, and they, as a kind of a passion project, they were developing for the past 10 years a flower down, which is an alternative to goose and dag down. Uh, which is extremely flammable, hyper, um, hi, uh, hypoallergenic, uh, extremely cool. Like if I'm gonna tell you now about the process of uh, uh, producing uh, down, it's, it's really, really very sad and very cruel. And um, so what they came up with, it's a real uh, flower that grows in Canada, um, a biopolymer, an aerogel, and actually this specific aerogel is what really took our scientists scientists more than, well, around 10 years to develop we, and 
as of today, the hold down is 100% biodegradable. And I'm happy to share more with you, Bill, because you always have uh, extra questions and very <laughs> relevant ones. Um, so uh, yes, it is uh, something very exciting. It's our 100% uh, proprietary technology of Pangaya um, that uh, the team is now um, talking to many outerwear brands and sportswear brands um, to very much hopefully for, for, for them to stop using goose and duck down and uh, start using uh, flower down. Imagine, you know, like even, you know, here I'm, I'm walking around, you know, wearing my jacket filled with flower down and you know, telling people that, well, flowers warm me up in cold Davos. <laughs> and um, I think it sounds, it sounds really exciting. You know? And when I tell my kids um, at home these stories, um, yeah, these stories excite them. <laughs> it's a, that's a beautiful story. Do we have any other questions? Yes, how can we help? Let's help the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How can we help? in the process in practical ways? I, you're asking me? Uh, oh. Go for it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, we mean so cust uh, uh, customers. Pardon? Become <laughs> customers, yeah. yeah. Yes. So I think the, the, I mean, a good thing to know is the most sustainable clothing that you can buy, you actually don't buy because you already own them. So making your clothing last, um, considering what the not just the price per wear is so this is always a trick that I try and apply imagine how often you're going to wear it what's the price per wear and then imagine what the impacts are of a garment and then how you can reduce them by wearing it and wearing it and extending the life I think that's critical again if you look at how the industry is exploding we're at this very uncomfortable situation where uh, the, the, the industry is just going up and up and up and increasing and we need to really slow that down and really treasure what we own. Um, second thing, wash smart. Don't pour chemicals that are toxic onto your clothing, into your washing machine. Find uh, an ecological detergent. Um, wash cold, uh, hang dry, because otherwise it's constantly energy and chemicals every single time you wash your clothing. And the third point I would say is shop smart and ask for transparency. Ask for transparency from the brands that you buy from. Um, look at what does that mean? What have the impacts been of that clothing item? Was it one uh, bathtub of water or was it hundreds of bathtubs of water to make it? What was the carbon footprint of the, uh, of the item? How have people been treated in the value chain? chain and I think with the legislation we'll be getting a step closer but just ask for transparency think about fashion revolution who made my clothes where are they from and take ownership and pride in what you buy I, I'd like to point out something here we heard about the geese and the ducks we have modern meadow here with us we have leather that is quite exquisite that didn't torture an animal well you've decide what you'd like to wear. And, and what's happening here, and I'll bring this back to Brun, is design is the first signal of human intention. So if we intend to design beautiful things, what are our intentions? And if we ask ourselves the obvious questions, then the rhetoric leads us quickly to the kinds of things we've just heard from Brun. Because you could ask, is it your intention to torture a bird mm. to stay warm in Davos? If you ask it that way, what is beautiful? That's not beautiful. And if we look at the 100x stipulations, I'll bet every one of them represents an intention and can be respectfully delivered as such. Do we intend to destroy $4 billion worth of clothes in one year because we got the wrong style or something? Or do we want to share them with someone else? Or Perhaps they don't want us to share it with them. Do you know that we can't export clothing waste basically anymore to Africa from the United States? They're overloaded with it. It's garbage. Did we intend to do that? You know, so I think if we track our intentions, we discover that our intentions are actually quite graceful and that the, you, will, you won't be asking these questions like, why are you doing this to me? You know, because it's ugly. Sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's an important point. Let's have one more question, and then Andy, you'll come up. One more short 
question and a short yes. answer. How's Thank that? you. There are a lot of products now made with uh, fabric from recycled plastics, mm -hmm. but some of those are also not good for the ocean. So what is it you're looking for? I know they were well-intentioned, but how do we as a customer or consumer or even a designer know what is good for the environment? These, these fabrics from recycled plastics, for example, or fishing nets. If I could, the, 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 there are the chemistries involved for toxicity and things like that. Clearly, those can you know, use standards like cradle to cradle or blue sign or like a tax or all that kind of thing. There are standards for this that, are, that will address some of the questions. Um, but as you point out, the ocean question for us is a new one for the world. And I, I'm very sure we will have ocean safe you know, protocols uh, soon because it is not our, not our intention to fill ourselves and our children with microplastics. I don't think so. But like, what are you going to do about it? Well, bingo. Welcome to France. Uh, but we're also going to have to talk to manufacturers and inventors and people who get the community excited about these things and say, we want to know what it is and we want to have a good time and we want it to be beautiful. And you know, so give us the right stuff. Huh? So I spoke to someone today, uh, not today, just at Davos, who blew my mind and he was an 18 year old I think one of the youngest people who are here and he's actually developed a new technology that I won't be able to explain properly but it was very simple using magnets and it was able to extract microplastics from water and I think we need to get him um, a washing machine deal so that for all of the yeah, ocean uh, machine deal yeah yeah but the polymers just, are magnetic by the way very important thing to know yeah they have polarity so before we phase out all of the wrong materials, we can at least make sure they don't go into the ocean. There you go. Yeah, he's 18. Well, we would like to thank uh, you for joining us today for uh, redesigning fashion for a sustainable future. Uh, we want to thank Bill McDonough for his poetic and scientific moderation. Uh, At the forum, we see uh, an industry, as many of the panelists mentioned, that hasn't changed in hundreds of years. Uh, yet we're on the precipice of a global middle class growing from 3.8 billion to 5.4 billion over the next 10 to 15 years. It's an industry that cannot continue down the path that's on, yet we see change that is slow, uh, but hopefully accelerating through policy changes, uh, such as those being advocated by the French government, consumers that are demanding different models and different ways to express themselves creatively, creatively and beautifully through fashion, through raw materials providers that are looking to innovate and bring sustainable and natural fibers back into uh, the, a dominant position in the market, and investors that are seeking innovation and to, again, uh, bring back beauty uh, today where there is uh, only a sustainable relationship. So. One more thing. We talk about the fourth industrial revolution. We talk about AI, machine learning, and so on. I'd just like to tell one of my favorite stories very quickly. It is from Gregory Bateson, Margaret Mead's husband, an anthropologist, in the early 70s, wrote a book to his daughter, Mary Catherine Bateson. And he's in the future. And he was studying Norbert Wiener at MIT, who coined the term cybernetics, and this idea of the singularity, the computers and the people coming together. This is 1973. A computer at that time, for those of us who can remember, um, was a piece of cardboard with holes punched in it. Right? <laughs> yes, no, you know, go. And that was about it. Anyway, so he's sitting here imagining we're in the future. And he's telling her the story. And he's in the future. And he's sitting in front of a computer and he says, tell me, computer, when do you think computers will begin to think like humans? And there's a long pause. And the computer says, hmm. That reminds me of a story. 